Yeah, I'm one of the administrators on California BATS, um, even though I'm a parent, not a teacher. Thank you. And um, my first experience with charter schools was as a West Side progressive mom thinking that we were, um, you know, this was reinventing education and charter schools were the new public schools and um, <clears throat> about my, my son went to a, um, preschool, a, a non-public preschool and about um, half the families at that, that, that school went through eighth grade and, um, and half the families left to start a charter which at that time technically was illegal, but they did that and uh, because you're not supposed, charter law was not supposed to, you know, be a mechanism, charters were not supposed to be a mechanism for a private school to function at, with public dollars, but they don't really make that distinction anymore so much. Um, but, uh, so I was enthusiastic. I really did think this was, um, this was just a new, way of um, implementing public education and uh, and I became really involved and I found um, out pretty quickly um, the, the the downsides of um, deregulated public education um, which is what I came to see charter schools as um, for example, uh, even though um, the, the bylaws were written in such a way that, that parents and teachers would sit on the board of this little charter, very quickly the bylaws were amended so that the people already sitting on the board would appoint future members and there would just be one parent who would run for office every year. And then it turned out that it's a conflict of interest for employees of a nonprofit to be on the board overseeing the, their employer. So teachers were no longer on the board. Um, as far as the school was based on a very unique curricular or unique in, in, in my community, it was based on the Waldorf pedagogy, which is worldwide, but there aren't a lot, um, uh, you don't see it in public schools um, a, as much. So we thought we were doing something really interesting, and it was sort of a laboratory, and that we were going to show that you could do this in a public school setting, and um, and, and school districts like LAUSD would look at what we were doing and say, wow, let's try this and let's try this and let's try this. Um, and um, so there were, uh, at one point, someone in, the, in LAUSD um, said to me, you know, you have experienced just about everything that can go wrong with a charter school. And so, and it's true, um, the, my daughter came home one day and told me she missed four on her standardized tests. And her brother said, how do you know how many you missed? They don't grade them. She said, well, our teacher lightly circled our wrong answers, but it's not cheating because she didn't tell us what the right answers were. And she only gave us one chance to go back and correct them. So that was the story in the LA Times. The teacher is no longer um, teaching there. Um, but the school rallied the, the troops to find out who had reported it. That was the most important thing. It was not about training the teachers. It turns out not one single teacher in that school had been trained on how to proctor standardized tests and what the requirements were. Um, so um, another time the school district, well, LAUSD was going to um, consider renewing our charter and um, 
and so we went before the board. I went just to observe, and it was my first LAUSD board meeting, and Monica Garcia said, why are people afraid to tell you what race they are when they enroll at your school? And we all laughed because we, the school was mostly white, and we were afraid to declare our race because if LAUSD looked at this all-white school, they would say, you can't have an all-white school. Um, we didn't know they really wouldn't care um, uh, eventually. But this was a time when charter schools were still, you know, trying to figure out how they could fit into the system. And so we, um, she said, you got to come up with a diversity plan because people are afraid to tell you what their race is. She didn't know we were hiding. So, um, so one of the mothers who um, was very involved and um, decided to create a diversity plan, and it was beautiful. And she said to the little charter school board, look, if you really want to attract a more diverse population, it's also socioeconomic. It's not just racial. And she was African American. And she said, we need to start recruiting in the preschools in, um, outside of the West Side. And, um, and we need to start um, offering a free or reduced lunch program. And we need to offer free after school care to some families. And I was so excited. I thought, this is the beauty of a charter school. And so the charter school board said, thank you. This is a great document. They took it to LAUSD. LAUSD renewed our charter for another five years, and we never opened that document again. And there was no free and reduced lunch program, and there was no um, reduced cost after, care, after school care because that was a moneymaker for them. And in fact, there was another charter school down the street, and someone would walk those students into our aftercare program because it was a revenue producing program. So there were all kinds of things. And if a parent would complain about something, um, the administrator of the school would say, who's now a charter school consultant, would say, um, you know, we are flying the plane as we are building it. And we are just, isn't that exciting? Isn't that exciting? And, um, and you know, it's not perfect. And we have a, a waiting list of 400 children. And so if this isn't really the school for you, you can move on. It's, it's, it, we understand. And so, and they didn't say, get the hell out of here. You know, we're tired of hearing you complain. They really believed that we, we, what we all now see as market-based reforms, that they had this demand, and if you were unhappy, you could go to another store. And so, um, so I became really quickly um, an advocate for um, increasing, I, 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 for, for making it look more like and feel more like a public school. And I tried that for several years. Um, I, I did convince them um, under threat of arrest. I convinced them that they had to comply with the Brown Act in their board meetings. And I refused to leave when they went into closed session once because the agenda was, it's something Carl would do, um, because the agenda was so vague. And I'm not a lawyer, but the Brown Act is a beautiful law, and it's really clear. And the First Amendment Coalition has put out pamphlets and made it very easy to understand. So I knew my rights, and I also knew the cell number of my local community newspaper reporter and I said, I'm going to this meeting and I think they're going to try to get me to leave. Can I call you if, if it happens? And he said, of course. So I just felt like, okay, at least he's going to come and cover this and they'll be embarrassed. So if I get arrested, uh, you know, they'll, the school will at least be embarrassed. So I felt a little bit of uh, um, a little security with that. 
And there were two lawyers on the board, and they tried to argue with me, but I, the law was right there. So they, adjourn, they adjourned their meeting, and, um, and they still comply with the Brown Act to this day. They do now comply with the Brown Act, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that and proud of that. But um, so, so I, at a certain point, I um, looked down the street at the middle school that I'd always swore I would never send my kids to because it seemed so chaotic and so loud and all this stuff. Um, and I um, pulled my kids out and I enrolled them there and it was the best thing I ever did and I, I still go to that school every single week and, and help at that school. Um, it is full of experts in education. No one is, in, is building a plane as they're flying it. And, um, and I've been really, really involved in, um, in fighting Prop 39 co-locations, which are a complete disaster um, for many reasons, um, and, uh, and helping some other schools deal with um, charter school issues. Um, and I'm just so happy to be uh, around people who are interested in, in, this, in this issue. So thank you. I, I do not think, I think there is a place for, um, for charter schools. If people are doing their job, and what I mean by that is we have um, a charter schools department division of LAUSD that um, could, their job could be to every, you know, month report to the board on the ideas that they saw, the, um, the implementation of, um, of practices in charter school classrooms and charter school communities that um, should be brought to scale in LAUSD. And a charter school is, I don't mean CMOs, I mean independent charter schools, are able to respond really quickly, make adjustments. It's a small organization. They can say, hey, starting on Monday, let's try blah, blah, blah. So if that were the case, if that's really what they were for, it would be like a lab school. Um, and it would inform practices in, in the district. But that is not, you know, the only, the only experimentation they want is with the governance model. That's, that's really all that they're interested in. It, and so, you know, so by, by that, it, it is too late. But I, I, I think originally, um, if, if people were operating on um, the original intent of charter schools and doing their job doing that, there, there could be a place for it. So I, I think that a lot of us are, you know, we've been talking about what our own experiences are and what, um, what you know, sort of lifting the veil on some of the, the charter lies. Um, and, and, you know, and I hear, what are we doing? You know, what can be done about this? I do not think that it is bleak. I really don't. I'm a parent. I do not have a union that um, represents me. I do not, you know, California Bats is a scrappy little Facebook, big Facebook group, um, and, and we can, um, organize and we can activate each other. Um, Paul and I have been having a great conversation with someone running for office in Orange County this morning, um, holding him accountable for his bullshit. Um, and so everyone who goes on his page sees that he can't just claim to be a supporter of public education and, and not do really concrete things. And that is what we need to do. Every single small thing matters. We wrote letters to the editor of the LA Times last week. I am telling you, Bennett can tell you, the LA School Board acquiesces to many things
that are in the LA Times. We are working very hard to influence the editorial board. It's crazy because we know who really has influence over them, but if you look, every single letter in the LA Times about Ref Rodriguez is throw the bum out. And that matters, it matters. It shapes public opinion in Los Angeles and it shapes the um, editorial board of the LA Times. And it shapes the decision. We are making it very uncomfortable for those board members to support him. And that's what we're trying to do. The other thing that we need to do, every single pu public official you meet, every single one, you need to ask them an education question. You need to either say, why are you allowing 500 cars to drive into my neighborhood and lower my property value because there was a school there, but now you've added a second school and there are no buses for this charter school? Or if you need to ask them something as, as a member of your union. Um, you know, there are there is an angle. I have become an expert at finding the education angle for every single political event I attend. Linda knows. Um, and every, from federal, I have my cheat sheet. Federal, state, and local. And um, I want every single one of us to be pushing all the organizations that we're involved in. Is it your neighborhood association? Is it your democratic club? Is it your union? Is it another civil rights group? How come the NAACP is standing alone in calling for a moratorium? Why is that? You know why? Because at the NAACP hearing here in Los Angeles, the guy from Mississippi, who's now, and I'm very sorry I'm not remembering his name because he's a great, great leader, um, he's now the, um, the acting president of the national NAACP, he said, I'll tell you why, because they hand us a check and they say, and by the way, here are your talking points. And he said, meanwhile, we've been here for 40 years fighting for educational access. Where were they then? It's only when it's privatized and they are handing out money that those, you know, that, that the charter school people are, are in gear. Sorry, I'm getting shrill. Um, but I do not want people to think that it is this big, awful monster that there's nothing we can do about. If we leave here, we spent a Saturday afternoon here. That means we really care about this issue. If we leave here and we do not commit to holding every elected official that we encounter accountable, by asking them a question about this, I want to make it embarrassing and toxic for any Democrat in the state of California to accept money from the Charter Schools Association. Gavin Newsom has announced that he is not interested in the charter school debate. That's not really an interesting debate. Well, he doesn't get to say that. He does not get to decide. He does not get to become the governor of California and decide that it's inconvenient for him to take a stand on privatizing public education. And lastly, what I'm working on with Democrats is to say, and this is at the club level, this is at the state convention level, is to say, why is it that Democrats will stand up and proclaim loudly and proudly their commitment to defend from privatization Social Security and the Veterans Administration. They would never dream of privatizing those institutions. We want to make them see that public education deserves the exact same declaration. So I'm asking you to join me in, in doing that, taking action every day. Find us on Facebook, California Bats. There's a fantastic discussion that goes on and lots of easily shareable things. And sign up for my email blast where I tear this stuff apart. Thank you.